it's back like an inexplicably popular cover of a Michael Jackson song ruined by a crappy alternative pop rock band. Final Fantasy XIII has just hit store shelves, and like every other fan who was hooked by the awesome old school console games, my addiction has forever doomed me to play every Final Fantasy game from now until the end of time, hoping in vain that they can capture even a fraction of the magic from the old days. Even though every Final Fantasy since number 7 has been a tedious, tooth-grinding descent into mediocrity. And that's Clone! why... Clone! Clone! Oh, hi, Black Lantern Spoonie. Ha! No longer! I've returned from death. And now, I am Spoonie the White. Wow! So, uh, what's being dead like? It turns out it's all pantheistic or something. When we die, we turn into part of the rocks and trees and birds. It's gay. Yes! I'm not going to hell for jerking off! <laughs> like you have a soul that can even go to hell, clone boy. Prepare to die! What? Why? I want my show back, and I'm not going to have some pile of rat filth that Linkar reanimated and brainwashed just taking over my life! Brainwashed? I'm not brainwashed. Here, perhaps a free t-shirt will make you feel better. I thought you might try to weasel your way out of this, but I'm not giving my show up without a fight. That's why I started training at a Shaolin monastery. Until I realized the lessons would be really expensive. So I just went out and bought this gun. Whoa, hey, hey, no need for that. Show's all yours, man. I quit. Wait, what? Yep, totally. Hey, no tricks now. I know me. No tricks. You can have this review with my blessing. And believe me, I think I'll just go make a new life for myself somewhere. Like, I don't know, New Mexico. Oh, cool, I guess. That was easy. Um, so, what am I reviewing? Final Fantasy X. <laughs> keep your show, keep your show, keep your show. Turns out there is a Turns out there is And you are going to live in it. <laughs> Okay then! If you remember, I managed to rage against Final Fantasy VIII for about an hour and a half, and yet I claim the far more beloved PlayStation 2 premiere, Final Fantasy X, was far, far worse than that. But you'll notice that I just skipped over number 9, and some of you might be wondering what I thought about that one, and that this might shock you, but, uh, well, I didn't like it. In fact, I tried to play it twice, and I could never force myself to play past the first two hours either time. Now this was years ago, and I'll be the first to admit, it was likely I was being fiercely unfair to what was probably a much better game that was, essentially, a huge throwback to all the old school stuff I'd been missing all this time. I mean, it's entirely possible that I just hated Final Fantasy VIII so much that it forever colored my perceptions of every game in the series since then, but I just think I really, really hated the art design. I know that's unfair, I admit that. I mean, I know it's like judging a book by its cover, but have you ever had that happen to you where everyone else really liked a movie or a game, and you could even admit that it might well have been a great game, but there was just something in the art design that you just, you just, you just couldn't get over it. It's like, uh, for me, it was like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I hated the design of Zaphod Beeblebrox. And I know a lot of people watch Star Trek, the new movie, and they just couldn't get over the sleek iPod design of everything. And with Final Fantasy IX, one look at the cover told me pretty much everything I needed to know. Let's see, this game is full of super deformed androgynous preteen furries. You know, basically everything I hate about anime. I could not have been less interested. The fastest way known to bore me with a game is with a cliché JRPG plot about preteen kids saving the world. Furries creep me out, and I hate androgynous-looking whiny pansy-ass characters. Oh, son of a bitch! Okay, I know, I know, my hatred of Final Fantasy X is not entirely rational. I mean, I have reasons, believe me, I have a lot of reasons, but there's just something about this game, something irrational, something instinctive, that whenever I see this guy, I just want to punch this motherfucker! This sissy shorts-wearing fucking bat face Leonardo DiCaprio-looking jack-off, fuck this guy! Fuck him and his leather lederhosen! I hate his fucking faggy Meg Ryan hair. I hate his smug fucking hideous Arch Hall Jr. face. I hate his stupid girly banana colored half vest. I hate his stupid squeaky nasal fucking voice. <laughs> and every fucking time he opens his big fucking mouth, I just want to stab him in the throat with an ice pick just to watch him die. I hate him. I hate you. I hate this game. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, um, I've got a lot of bad memories about this game, and, um, they all just, they, they, they kind of came, like, rushing back in all at once, and, I mean, if you didn't play this game, you don't understand, but, um, look, it's, it's okay now, I'm okay, um, I, I think, you know, I, I think I just needed to vent and kind of get it all out, and I've done that, and, um, I, I, I kind of think I can handle this rationally from here on out. Listen to my story. No! Fuck you! Fuck your story! It sucks! Someone help me! Send help! Help! If that sort of life is what you wish, you may grow up to be a fish. Oh, would you like to? I've been told that it might help if I started by outlining some of the more positive aspects of the game. Okay. As is standard for the series, the soundtrack is excellent. The cutscenes are heartbreakingly beautiful, and almost all of them are striking and memorable. And even though I hate to admit it, the battle system in this game is really, really damn good. Combat is fast and strategic, mixing up your enemy's strengths and weaknesses, and forcing you to tag your party members in and out to deal with each encounter's unique enemy placements. Some enemies can fly, some are at a great distance, and some can surround you. An incredibly convenient meter at the top right tells you when everyone in the combat will go in turn. Best of all, there's no drawing magic, no artificial resource collection, no bullshit junctioning magic spells to ability scores, and no triple triad weighed off my mind. No. Where this game falls really flat on its face is the absurd, underlying absurd character design, the linear as hell no surprises plot, and, well, just about every techno shit bubble-headed fantasy concept this game introduces. For instance, let's just try to clock out how far I get in the story before I find something I hate. The game opens in the fantastic futuristic city of Xanarkin, where we can see people gathered around- Stop! What is that? Ugh, it looks like some kind of weird holographic pillar tree mushroom thing. Seriously, what the fuck is it? In the future, streetlights will be weird, expensive, ugly things that beam out halos of nonsense holograms. Why is that thing here? What does it do? Why would people build it, and why would they gather around it? Ugh, anyway, we meet our hero as he gets mobbed by his adoring fans to sign their enormous 20-sided dice. Wow, he's the first ever Dungeons & Dragons celebrity! Well, actually, it's a ball, but since the scene isn't pre-rendered, spheres are composed of jutting, jagged polygons. This is Titus, who is, believe it or not, a man, but sort of like Bob Dylan in the movies is played by a woman. He's a blitzball player. What's Blitzball? Aside from the stupidest fakie made-up sport since Kosho from The Prisoner, in which two athletes karate fight on trampolines surrounding a pool? Okay, imagine if you will an enormous hundred-yard diameter sphere of water suspended in mid-air that suddenly materializes in a matter of seconds before a stadium audience. Players dive into the water and attempt to throw a ball into the opposing team's goal. It's a bit like water polo, really only lamer and harder to see and physically impossible. But Spony, some of you are saying, this is Final Fantasy. It's science fiction fantasy. If you're willing to suspend your disbelief and accept the notion of people wielding black magic, fighting a flying Godzilla, and enormous chickens used as personal transport, can you really call bullshit on Blitzball? Yes! I can call bullshit! Let me count the ways! Let's see, a uh, giant floating spear of water. Bullshit! Which appears in a matter of seconds from seemingly nowhere. Bullshit! In which athletes compete underwater, holding their breath for at least five minutes at a time without once coming up for air. Bullshit! Unless you're like Guybrush Threepwood or something. Seriously, this is never once explained, but it's a major aspect of the gameplay that Blitzball players are capable of holding their breath for hours at a time. I just don't get it. This isn't something you have to be a doctor to understand, or something people just casually get wrong. This is a universally well-known fundamental limit of human endurance. Now, yes, some people are capable of holding their breaths for absurdly long periods of time, but they're not playing fucking soccer while they're doing it! It'd be like me inventing a game where people light themselves on fire and play tennis in a cube made of bees floating in outer space. I don't care how good an athlete you are, it's just not gonna happen. Now, I'll have to come back to Blitzball periodically, because I'm not kidding, most of Final Fantasy X revolves around the fucking game. But what really gets on my tits is just that it's physically impossible. You don't need to be a physicist to realize that you can't throw a volleyball underwater. You can't. You can't. 
I don't care if you're Harry fucking Potter and you were riding a jet-powered broomstick underwater and fired the fucking ball out of a bazooka. The ball ain't moving like this. Nor is it physically possible to leap 20 feet into the air from underwater, even if you do enter Matrix time to do it. Why Titus does this, by the way, that is, why he leaps out of the water, I have no earthly clue. But suddenly Godzilla attacks and smashes the stadium. Oh! Gojira! Gojira! Run! Somehow Titus survives this fall, gets up and runs into some guy he knows named Oren, this smooth pimp daddy who's just about the only character in this game that I can stand, and who is also one of the most badass characters in the entire history of the Final Fantasy series. Why? Well, we never learn all that much about him, aside from the fact that he looks like an old grizzled bastard with tons of scars and samurai skills. All the guy carries around, all he needs, is a big fucking sword and a huge jug of booze. Man, I love this guy. We called it Sin. Sin starts wrecking the city, and all the while little scales are breaking off his body, turning into monsters and attacking. Yep, this monster is so tough that its dandruff comes alive and kills you. But luckily our brave hero leaps into action. Oh dear god. This guy's supposed to be the hero. I'll harm you! Well, Oren gives him an extra sword, if only to spare his own dignity, but they don't get far. Oren! You can just tell that Oren is seriously considering letting this little twerp fall to his death. If he dies, I'll be the hero of this game. It all begins here. I had made it out of the frying pan and into the freezer. He wakes up in some mysterious flooded ruins where he gets chased by a fish who sucks, but he gets away, only to run straight into another monster. Things look bad when suddenly... Snub into a Slim Jim! Ooh, yeah! No, it's a group of jumpsuited weirdos led by Riku, another character who always manages to find fresh ways to annoy me every time I see her. Never mind that I have a healthy fear of teenage chicks with easy access to hand grenades, but she's also become a multiple award-winning gaming sex symbol. Seriously, I'm not making this up. Riku has nothing to do with the plot at all. The entire purpose of her character is blatant, disturbing fan service, and to be honest, it kinda creeps me out. I remind you, Riku is supposed to be 15 years old, and yet this game revels in every opportunity it can find to objectify her sexually. Don't even get me started on the sequel, which takes off even more of her clothes so you can see her thong. She's 15! And look at this one! This is from the instruction book, and it seems to imply that she's naked, or at least topless. You want to talk about disturbing trends in video games? Forget violence! Let's talk about the fact that many gamers consider a 15-year-old underage girl to be an ideal sexual fantasy conceived by Japanese perverts! Yeah, oh yeah, you heard me. If this were a live-action game, we'd all be registered sex offenders by now. This is dirty, creepy stuff, and you should all be ashamed for- Oh my god, that's hot! No! Focus! Stupid sexy cosplayers. Not to imply that Riku is alone in being shamelessly objectified. Pretty much everybody sacrifices their dignity in the name of fan service, since in Spira, everyone wears hilariously revealing street clothes combined with the camera's unerring ability to find a way to focus on someone's ass looming enormously in the foreground in nearly every shot. It happens so often that you're bound to lose count, but that won't stop me from trying. Okay, so Riku is an owl bed, and no, I don't really know what that means, except they love robots, wear goggles, and have spiral pattern eyes. <laughs> yeah, great character design. What idiot came up with that? Has anyone seen Neutro? I had it parked out back. It's a giant robot about, ooh, 200 feet tall, uh, level cities. What? Oh, and the Albed speak a fakey Star Wars type language that gets translated if you find all the hidden thingies around the world. Translating Albed's a waste of time anyway, since you'll only really understand it on a second playthrough. And <laughs> really, what idiot would subject himself to this pile of fuck all over again? It's not like you learn anything useful, they're saying pretty much what you think they're saying. I have no idea why they think that. It's not like you encounter any monsters in the game that are even vaguely humanoid. They all look like fish or hornets or frowning scoops of ice cream. And I kind of doubt there's an Arch Hall Jr. looking Cylon model, but, you know, they should probably kill him with hand grenades anyway, just to be sure. Right, whatever. 
Toy Hood Quebec? So Titus learns from Riku that he's been transported a thousand years into the future and everything he knows and loves from Xanarkand is long, long dead. Like his fashion sense. To prove he's not a Cylon, he helps Riku salvage the sunken ruins using his unique technical knowledge of the machines of the past. By banging on it. Yeah. These guys invented anti-gravity and robots. But then, I'm trying to find reason in a game where you can steal hand grenades from fish. After killing an evil squid infesting the airship and salvaging it, they still don't trust him. Wait, Wichita! I enjoy the fact that nobody likes him. That's our hero, folks. Too stupid to eat. Where are you from? Xanarkand. I'm a Blitzball player. Star player of the Xanarkand Abes. Don't tell anyone you're from Xanarkand, Kay. Yevon says it's a holy place. You might upset someone. Oh, uh-huh. You know, amateur. Who you play for? The Xanarkand Abes. Sorry. Sin attacks again, knocks Titus out again, and he awakens in an unfamiliar place. Again. This time he's on an island where he finds a team of Blitzball players called the Besaid Aurochs. What's an Auroch? Uh, I don't know! I'm far more distracted by the dipshit with the mother of all cow licks. D dude seriously? When you make Ed Grimley look dignified and subtle, you should probably just kill yourself, I must say. Good lord. Can you imagine the nautical tons of hair gel that go into making that thing? And waterproof, no less? He must dunk his head in a sink full of roofing sealant every day. This guy. Just get used to this guy, because he never shuts the fuck up. He's also got the dumbest weapon in the history of Final Fantasy, and for a series that's featured such ridiculous weapons as the Gunblade, a wrist-mounted dog launcher, and a seven-foot-tall Moogle robot driven by a cat robot that hits people with a megaphone, that's saying a lot. This guy is killing people with a fucking dodgeball! Yeah, you know, sometimes I let a little air out of it, so when it hits, it leaves a welt, yeah? I, I, I just can't get over this. His weapon of choice to battle the hordes of darkness is a volleyball. And you, and you know what the sick thing is? The sickest part is that he's probably one of the best fighters in the entire game. He's one of the only people who can melee attack flying creatures, and once I found a magic blitz ball that instantly turned most monsters to stone, Oh, yeah, there are magic blitz balls, fabled weapons of legend, no doubt. Once I found the blitz ball that turned monsters to stone, I barely had to worry about combat anymore. His basic melee attack did more damage than any of the frontline fighters with five foot long swords using their special skills and the Black Mage's Ultima spell. Even better, the guy always, always catches the ball, even if he's throwing it at Godzilla from the deck of an airship going Mach 1 a hundred yards away. It just comes right back. Hey! Anyway, Titus meets these dudes and instantly wins their worship when he reveals his ability to casually shatter the laws of physics. This gives Waka such a huge boner, he immediately rapes Titus in his tight ass until he agrees to join his sucky blitzball team for a big tournament in Luka. See, the orcs have never won a game, probably because it's hard to practice without a stadium-sized anti-gravity water sphere generator in your armpit of a village. Waka takes him back to Besaid to take some hits off his blitz bomb, and along the way we meet some other guys. Who are they? Luzu and Gata, Crusaders. Huh? Cruise of what? Oh, do you see why I hate this guy? He's easily and measurably dumber than Waka! Once he gets to the village, Titus hits up the local temple and learns that the new apprentice summoner has been inside the Cloister of Trials for over a day now, but hasn't come back out yet, which is slightly unusual. In a bizarre outburst of nobility, Titus just runs inside the most sacred ground of the village to save her. The precepts must be obeyed! Like I care! Johnny, don't go, it's too dangerous. I don't care! Like I care! Your religion is a hollow lie! Yeah! So you go inside the temple, handle some balls, and eventually find a group of the enormous gazongas! Uh, tits jugs Lulu, I mean, it's just Lulu, the boob mage, black mage. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just pretty fun bags. Flustered! Good lord! How does she even stand upright with mommy zeppelins that huge? It's gotta be a constant struggle to keep those puppies holstered since she doesn't wear a bra. If she ever had to run those things and bounce right up and give her a dang concussion, I mean, damn! I bet she became a wizard just to learn a spell to cure the lower back problems she must have hauling those mammaries everywhere. Now I know why Waka's so obsessed with large round objects, I mean, Jesus! 
We also meet Chewbacca here, another protector of the summoner doormat. I mean, Yuna. Turns out nothing at all was wrong with Yuna's trial, so Titus just managed to piss all over decades of village tradition and defiled their most holy temple for absolutely no good reason. So, instead of taking the infidel out to the village square, publicly castrating him and burning him at the stake like they should, they decide to take him along on Yuna's pilgrimage to defeat Godzilla. This works out great for Waka, since he's Yuna's sworn protector, and it's on the way to the Blitzball Championship in Luka. Because saving the world and Blitzball are equally important in Waka's eyes. So what's our goal? To do our best! For protection, Waka gives Titus his brother's sword, you know, keeping the far deadlier Blitzball for himself. Honest question, if Blitzballs are such dangerous, deadly weapons, why doesn't Titus use one? After all, he's a far superior Blitzball player to even Waka. But he's not the best. No, that would be Titus's father, Jekt, and we know this because of all of the many, many topics that Titus likes to whine incessantly about. His favorite, by far, is his daddy issues. See, his daddy never hugged him enough, and Titus always resented that. Actually, in all the flashbacks we see, Jekt really treats little Titus like dirt. You with a woman? You can't even catch a ball! Oh, what's, what's the matter? Gonna cry again? Cry, cry. That's the only thing you're good for. I like Jekt already. If ever a little fucker needed a beating in constant emotional abuse, it's this dude. Try to look at it from Jekt's point of view. You're the greatest Blitzball player and Captain Jack Sparrow impersonator who ever lived, and this is the whiny brat who's gonna inherit your family name? Would you ever be able to deal with the shame, the cold hard fact that your loins produce such a wispy screeching abomination? Would you ever be able to claim this sawed off, pasty, fish faced little fucking bastard as your kid? Every time Jack looks at this waste of Lederhosen, he's gotta be wondering what sin he committed to blight the world with such a blitheringly stupid cunt creature instead of the son he always wanted. I mean, how would you feel if you produced this unholy spawn, the world's greatest argument for partial birth abortions? Anyway, the gang takes a boat over to Luca, powered both by wind in their sails and several giant chickens on hamster wheels. Titus tries flirting with Yuna, which is both nauseating and incredibly awkward. The wind. It's nice. Ah, yeah, they called in George Lucas to punch up the dialogue. Quick, start talking about sand! <laughs> Somehow commenting that the wind is good draws uproarious laughs from Yuna. You know, at this rate, Titus might actually have a shot at getting into Yuna's panties. The girl appears to have the IQ of a styrofoam cup. Hey, I almost forgot! This is an RPG! Let's go barging into everyone's personal belongings and take everything valuable we find! Cause I'm the hero! This is my story! Uh, this, this could take a while. Beep. 